The Garys, in their own words, are Dream Blood, Harmony, Surf Rock, Doom Wop on Morphine. For anyone out there unfamiliar with that genre, I would describe them as storytellers bringing life to situations and destinations that are often un underappreciated, unknown, or forgotten. Welcome, Julie. My first question to you, is it safe to go in the water? <laughs> Maybe not yet. I don't know. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, yeah, I love the way that you guys describe yourselves because if someone's going to try to put you in a genre, why not be in a league of your own? Yeah, I think that that descriptor is sort of amalgamated from like a bunch of things people have said to us over the years that we've sort of liked. And uh, so we've kind of cobbled it together from feedback we've gotten from listeners. That's fair. Now, a lot of times I notice with, say, like surf-esque music, you're kind of dealing with a wall of sound, almost like getting crashed by a giant wave. But the one thing that I really appreciate about your band is kind of like in the way it's described, you have like this dreamy uh, aesthetic to your sound. And I was wondering if that kind of comes from the fact that you, you put three-part harmonies on your music and it kind of has to be a little bit uh, subdued to be able to pull those off. Um, yeah, there's probably something to that. Um, I think also the, you know, the blood harmony thing, um, and, and, and us being sisters, our, our, our voices are quite similar and that kind of makes that, you know, those, those vocals can kind of blend together. And sometimes it's hard even for the three of us to, when we're singing to know exactly for sure, you know, which voice belongs to whom. Um, and that, you know, that probably happens for listeners as well. Um, so that probably adds to that dreamy quality, um, as well uh makes it all just a little bit um yeah just uh, maybe a little bit uh, ethereal in that way but you guys have been consistent the entire time before you put out your first album were you playing this style of music for a while um well we actually our first album came out pretty shortly after we started playing together as a group so not really um i think if you listen to our recordings too you can sort of hear an evolution um, from the first one to the more recent ones. Um, so it sort of it sort of captures our growth as a band as well, and and how we've kind of defined our sound over the years. Um, so yeah, we were doing that that kind of sound since the beginning, but not for very long since you know since we started to record it. Now I asked for you to send me Burger Boy because the way that I came across your band is I was just hanging out with my kid while they were having a bath and I was like, I want to hear some surf music. I think I I just Googled Saskatchewan surf music and that was the first song that came up, like the album through YouTube. And I thought, wow, what a great way to start an album. It really set the scene for what was what was to come. And I've noticed like with all the that you've put out since you have a consistency to go like not just singles, but to actually feel like you're going on a journey from start to finish. And with that song, I was wondering if that was kind of, if you had that in mind, like this was going to be the cornerstone, this is going to be the start and everything else is going to branch from here. Um, I think maybe I, I can't recall exactly, but that was definitely one of the earliest songs we wrote on that album, Surf, Surf Manitou. Um, and uh, Surf Manitou like started with one or two tracks and then gonna balloon into a whole concept album about Manitou Beach in Saskatchewan. Um, and so that's probably one of the, if, need, if it's not the first song we wrote, it's probably the second one because Burger Boy is like just an iconic beachfront, you know, walk up burger stand in Manitou Beach. Um, and it's just such a fun place to visit when you're there. Um, so yeah, I think it, it probably was the kind of part of the cornerstone, as you say, for that reason. We also put a little, um, there's like a little chiming intro to it. That's sort of a nod to, um, sort of an obscure reference to, to Grease 2, uh, where they would do this little like um, kind of xylophone intro to start like school announcements, like when the principal was gonna say something over the intercom or whatever. Um, yeah. So it's kind of a nod to that. So that also kind of kicks off the album with like, you know, this little ringing, um, uh, I think it's a vibraphone actually is what we played, this ringing vibraphone thing that says like, pay attention, like something's, something's coming up. That's awesome. Now I wanna shift over to your 2020 release. You did a music score. I've, I've listened or I watched the entire thing once in its entirety. It took me a couple of tries because it's it's quite long. Yeah. And when I read the the description on it, I didn't realize at first that it was recorded live. And I was just blown away thinking, 
Well, you guys obviously had to practice that at least once uh, to get it all <laughs> done. How, how did that come about? Um, so we got invited by the Roxy Theater in Saskatoon to uh, do a film in their silent classic series. So they had been running it for a few years before we did it in 2019. Um, where they would invite uh, a band, uh, usually a rock band of some kind, to do a score to go with a, a horror, like a silent horror film. Um, so they just asked us if we would be interested in doing it, um, and they gave us um, rain to pick the film as long as it was a silent movie and it was in the public domain and it was feature length. It could have been anything. So we did a bit of research to find a film that hadn't already been done. Um, and that was also, you know, kind of scary, spooky. Uh, we were looking for something too, that had some female representation in it. Cause that's pretty rare when you're looking at movies from the early night, uh, you know, the early 1900s, there's not a lot of women in those stories. Um, yeah. so looking for all those things, we settled on the hex and, um, yeah, and it was it was a month long process to get it ready and and to be able to perform it live, um, in October 2019 in front of an audience at the Roxy Theater. So um, it was a lot of work, as you say. It was it's a long film. It's like an hour 45 minutes. Uh, we we performed it with an intermission, so we got a little bit of a break in there. But um, pretty much, if you if you go to YouTube and watch the whole thing, that's all exactly as the audience heard it. Now, was it unfamiliar territory to try to put something like that together? Like, you guys didn't stray away from your sound, so was it just tr having to figure out the changes in the acts that was the biggest obstacle? Yeah, totally. It's like a, it's quite a different approach because we wanted to make sure the film was, um, that our music was accompanying the film, and we weren't just, like, you know, riffing, riffing with this film in the background. We wanted to serve the movie and, and make it part of the experience of watching the, make our music, you know, make make that part of the experience of watching the film. Um, so we had to watch the movie very carefully, many, many different times and, and kind of arrange it by chapters or sort of moods or themes that would return sometimes. Um, and then also decide like how we were gonna transition between each of those when the scene would change. and. We put it up on a projector in my basement where we jam and we would just, you know, practice playing it with the movie playing in the background over and over. And there was a lot of communication between the three of us, like kind of visual and verbal as much as we could to get those cues and, and make sure we were changing properly. And it was uh, it felt like a bit of a high wire act to do it live as well. But I think it went pretty well. Now, the one last thing I want to ask about it is I love how underneath almost the entirety maybe it is the entirety there's like this swirling echoey sound going on but i assume it was like a, a tape delay or something like that is that the case uh yeah depending on which of those sounds you're referring to there was like uh both erica the guitarist and myself were using uh delay pedals um so yeah there's definitely um some new effects that we experimented and played with when we were doing that score that we don't typically use uh, or at least we didn't earlier to that but they're on all, they're on the pedal boards now so maybe we'll use them more in the future <laughs> Well, and that's uh, something that really fascinates me is you guys are coming out with the new album, September 24th. How hard was it to not say, you know what, maybe this time we should put out a funk album? <laughs> Just go completely left field. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think we were we were trying to sort of return to the, you know, the format of constructing like a, you know, three minute pop rock song that you could kind of enjoy on its own. Um, so that was sort of nice to go back to that, but there's definitely some of the, some of those sort of dark themes and elements did kind of squeak into this new album as well. So there's one track in particular that I'm thinking of um, that when we were playing it, we were like, oh, this is like the Haxony track from this album. Cause it's good. It's like darker and heavier than maybe would have, maybe we would have ended up with without making that record first. For sure. Yeah. I, I, maybe I know the one you're talking about, but I definitely noticed with just the track list that there was, it does feel like it's going to be a little bit more playful and dark in that way. Yeah. I hope there'll be some, you know, new surprises from people there. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, um, somewhere in between our previous, you know, normal album and our Hexen score, it's kind of landing somewhere in, in, in between all of that, I think. Now I'm really looking forward to when it is going to be released. We're going to play Get Thee to the Nunnery. For anybody that is maybe familiar with your past sound, but not what's coming out in September, what would you say is going to be something that you've grown uh, or some growth you've you've had over the last while that you're going to be able to hear in this? 
Um, well, I, I think um, it's it's quite consistent with our sound for sure, but the process by which we made it was new. Um, we got to work with Dallas Good of the Sadies um, as the producer for this album. Um, and he was really excellent about collaborating with us and, and helping us um, to sort of get our vision, um, you know, into the recording um, and, and play with some kind of new approaches um, like new sounds, in some cases, some new pedals and new effects and that kind of thing. Uh, so I think the sound is is really quite consistent with what we've done earlier and with our live sound, uh, but maybe with just some more polished and refined kind of production approaches that uh, that we kind of were able to get from him, from from his guidance and his collaboration. Well, that's exciting. Uh, I noticed on your social media today you said that pre-orders are available at this point. Yeah, they're on our Bandcamp page, so... We're doing pre-orders for vinyl and CDs and cassettes if anybody out there has got a tape deck in their truck or something and they want to get a new tape for it. How about 8-track? <laughs> no 8-track yet, but <laughs> maybe I'll come back. We'll see. Yeah, maybe someday. <laughs> well, Julie, I want to thank you so much for spending some time here with me, and I hope you'll join me again when uh, your album is released in, in September because I'd love to hear it and then uh, pick your guys' brains about what's going on in it. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for reaching out, Daniel. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoy listening and thanks so much for playing the music.